Hi everyone, my name is Justin Hattendorf and I'm the Director of Product Design at NTOP. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about field, optimiza field optimization, which is an open framework um, to be used for a, a advanced manufacturing. And today I'm presenting on behalf of Christian Thompson. This is Most of this is his work, um, and unfortunately he wasn't able to make it today. Hello, can you guys hear me? Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about why NTOP exists in the first place. So. Um, so manufacturing today has advanced pretty dramatically. Um, so today, uh, systems are highly automated. Um, we're talking about additive manufacturing here today. Um, and it's a pretty dramatic change from the 80s if you see in the photos here. Um, but unfortunately, our, our design tools haven't changed a whole lot. Most of our design tools today are really based on the same principles as they were in the 80s through the 2000s. Um, and really, we believe that that's creating a design issue. We believe that design is really the core issue to, or the, the real bottleneck in product development today. So in 2016, this is why we formed NTOP. Um, we are, are working to resolve some of these problems in design and manufacturing and bring those closer together. So our core tech is really what defines or differentiates NTOP from other uh, softwares out there. So our first principle, or first pillar is really implicit modeling. Um, so this is a volumetric technology um, it's a little bit different than uh, BRAP or Mesh. Um, it's basically a technology that we're interested in because it won't break. Um, we know that it's always going to produce a solid and a void, uh, which is really important for knowing um, if something's going to be manufacturable in the physical world. Um, we also have an implicit model. So the idea is that you can use real world data, uh, whether that's physical data, simulation data, or um, just data that you enter into the software, um, and use that to drive the behaviors of your design. We also um, are use process of automation. So we believe that um, as you're designing, you shouldn't just be building a single part. You should be building a re reusable process so that you can reuse that on your next project that is using uh, a similar type of material, or like we do quite a lot of lattices. Um, so basically, we want to make sure that none of that work goes to waste and that becomes integrated into your designs. Um, so today, NTOP enables some of the world's most advanced products, so um, with ro um, robotics, mechanical design, um, aerospace, uh, light using light weighting applications, um, and even in uh, medical devices, um, uh, patient-specific devices, um, like this braces is an example. And we worked with a, a wide range of companies to do that. Um, and we work in six main applications. So. Um, first one being light weighting, that's probably our most common one, um, where we're helping our customers reduce the weight of parts, lower the cost, and increase the strength of their parts. Uh, thermal management, so increasing heat transfer and reducing the volume of parts. Mass customization, so reducing the time to the time it takes to design a complex part um, and highly customized parts that are patient specific. Um, so in, in this case, we can do 12 designs per hour. Industrial design, so enhancing ergonomics and performance while also iterating faster. And I think this is the most important part about implicit modeling is you can work very fast and get that fast feedback so you can make better design choices. Um, architected materials, so achieving um, a wide range of material properties uh, using things like lattices to adapt to product specs. Um, and manufacturing and tooling, so this is reducing the cost of tooling in typically traditional manufacturing. Um, like jigs and fixtures, molds, um, really decreasing the time it takes to make um, that type, uh, or those types of parts. Um, so before talking about field optimization, I want to talk a little bit about generative design, um, just kind of that, to contextualize why we're talking about fields in the first place. Um, so one of my favorite things to do is, <laughs> before doing a presentation on generative design, is Google what's going on in generative design. What's the definition today of generative design? The Wikipedia has changed dramatically over the past five years. And here are a few quotes of that. I'm not going to spend time talking about any of these quotes because they're all over the place. I think what I really do want to spend time talking about is the principles of generative design. And um, we, we believe that generative design needs to be open. And this is going to be a foundational principle that I'll show later with field optimization. Um, so we need, that, we need generative design to be flexible integrations with, provide flexible integrations with algorithms. Um, they need to be intuitive expressions of your design intent, um, creative interplay of physical data and digital processes. So the human has to be in the loop here um, to be able to tell the computer what to do, how to do it, and how to link that back to the physical world. Um, and it, it should be empowering in high complexity environments. So gender design itself is not new. Um, one example is in, in the field of electronics, for example. Um, if you look at kind of Intel's original 
processor, 16-bit, 29,000 transistors, is mostly that done with hand schematics. Um, but in order for the product architecture to advance, basically electronics needed new tools to work with uh, to be able to manage the complexity that was possible. So if you look at a typical transistor today, or a, a, a chip today, Apple One Ultra, 64-bit, 114 billion transistors in a much smaller space, five nanometer design. So the enabling factor there is software. Uh, it's electronic design automation is a way to separate the logical from the physical so that you can abstract your design process into a, um, like an actionable thing that the computer can make or can help make. Um, similarly in software, if you look at the 1980 Enterprise Space Shuttle, 400,000 lines of code um, to launch a vehicle into space, uh, mostly hand schematics as well, to kind of, or handwritten kind of logic to get that started. I think in order, like today's average car is pretty dramatically different, 100,000 or 100 million lines of code. And really that's only achievable by abstracting the design, abstracting the space uh, with model-based design principles. So uh, we believe that the same principle needs to be applied to hardware design. Um, so if you look at a typical heat exchanger, hundreds of parts, a casted and extruded with traditional manufacturing, um, in order to really increase the scale and get the full of unit cells within something, um, there's, it's really not possible with traditional CAD today. Uh, and generative design is a necessary tool to do that. So um, we think that gener generative design needs to couple geometry, simulation, and manufacturing together into a loop um, to be able to achieve that. Um, so the tools that we offer today um, have gotten, us pretty, or gotten our customers pretty far. Um, we have tools for topology optimization, we have automation tools like NTOP Automate, which can help you like, run the command line and execute a bunch of designs, a bunch of param uh, sweep over a bunch of parameters in, design, in a design space. Um, and then field-driven design to be able to couple, like let's see, stress data for this bike seat uh, to inform like how a lattice should perform. So making it more dense in some areas that are under high, high stress and less dense in others. So, um, but as our customers have advanced in added manufacturing, so did the complexity of their design problems. So. Um, at the beginning, it's easy. Additive is really interesting, and like you can do quite a lot of novel things with design software and additive manufacturing in general. Um, over time, like we've seen a lot of point solutions, like where additive is solving an important problem in their business. Um, but I think what we really need to push for is additive, where it's driving a competitive advantage. Like how how is the complexity and and additive in general like giving a company's competitive advantage, where it's not just solving one problem, but it's solving a wide range of problems and. We think, um, or if, if we look at some of what, what our customers are saying about kind of generative design today, um, about top, topology optimization, for example. So the, the free form organic parameterization of topology optimization doesn't give me enough control. So people want to be, want to be more in tune with what the computer's doing. That's the important takeaway there. Um, I need design tools that can adapt to the unique requirements uh, for each of my projects. So people need flexible tools. Um, something like topology optimization, like it isn't quite open enough for uh, someone to be able to inform or give more information uh, that can feed in from their projects. How can I better account for the complex multifunctional requirements of my AM part? Um, so basically, like, you know, topology optimization is a good example where it's like good at creating solids, not great at creating like multi-scale. Um, uh, like uh, geometry, like dealing with lattices. Um, and when controlling my geometry, or, or while controlling my geometry with fields is useful, I still need to be able to manually edit my model to close the loop or finish my designs. So we need the geometry at the other end to be able to plug back into um, model, uh, modeling uh, um, um, functions, basically. Um, so this is why we introduced field optimization. Um, so. Uh, design optimization today, um, kind of like leading up to field optimization. Um, is, so in the 90s, you start to see like, parametric optimization. So optimizing a few p fixed dimensions. Um, and it's still useful today, but not, not quite dealing with the complexity that we need to. Um, in the 2000s, uh, you start to see more like shape optimization. So you can optimize a predetermined shape. Um, usually the, the shape that you can enter is pretty constrained. Uh, we can optimize an existing shape, but it's not really creating anything new. Um, with topology optimization, it's pretty open, uh, or like, like the types of shapes you can make are organic, freeform. It works really well with additive manufacturing because these either easiest to produce with additive manufacturing, um, but it is limited mostly to solid geometry. 
So today, what we're introducing is field optimization, which is a flexible, open, multi-scale multi optimization framework built specifically for implicit modeling and field-driven design. So really what we're trying to do is couple uh, implicit, implicit modeling with field-driven design in an optimization loop. Um, so what is it actually? So uh, it is a gradient-based optimization framework for implicit geometry representations with field-based design parameters. So uh, what that really means is we're able to take um, an implicit representation and couple that with field data. And field data can be any sort of spatial data. Um, but the important part about it that, a part of all of that is that it's parameterized. So um, I'll show you a quick example of how that works in a second. Um, the parameterization um, basically maps design variables over a structure's response through simulation, testing, or equations. So um, a lot of examples that we've seen with this, because uh, our software is make mostly uh, is making lattice designs really easy today. Um, so an example of that is using physical testing data from lattice tests um, and feeding that back. Then you run an optimization. So this is a pretty typical optimization framework. So you set up objectives, constraints, uh, and define your bounds on your design variables and run it. Um, and then synthesizing all of those results. So what you'll get at the other end, uh, it's not just a, like in, in contrast to topology optimization, what you're getting is kind of a synthesized uh, geometry field that's responding to whatever you've parameterized from the beginning. So in this case, we've parameterized how a unit cell performs. So what we're getting is a result that's performing at a global scale um, of how uh, re responding to the data we put in, or we mapped in at a local scale. So the most important part of all of this is the modular architecture. I won't talk too much about this, but it's a pretty, pretty typical framework. Um, set up design responses, objective, constraints, um, and parameterization. So um, an example of a, an objective is I want to minimize weight. Um, an example of constraints is so ensure that the stress is below X under these conditions. So the most, the most important part about all of this is the end, the, the, the last part, the parameterization, which in this case, using this lattice infill. So let's take a look at what using this lattice infill really means. So, um, so what you can do then is iterate over your design space. So what this means is say you have a lattice unit cell and you want to test like how the thickness relates to the performance of, of that unit cell overall. So we, we basically iterate over that and calculate each local um, kind of response and compile that into um, kind of any sort of like raw CSV, any sort of like tabular data. Um, once that's compiled, um, you can then synthesize that back again, bring that back into um, a, a, a response service, um, and any sort of response service can be generated. So for example, uh, like you can have a response for stress. Um, you can have a response for uh, geometry. Um, and then at the last step is to package that back up into a block, um, which is the kind of core element in our software that like, feeds into the other algorithms. Um, so with that parameterization, I'll go through a quick example of like, what that means for like, a Voronoi foam parameterization. So the first thing you do is parameterize the geometry. So um, let's say we'll, over the x dimension, we'll vary the cell size. So, uh, Voronoi is generated from a set of seed points, and you can see the density is changing. Um, so we can basically vary the, the cell size and then add a varied beam thickness from left to right. Um, so basically, that's the geometry parameterization is nice, but really what's most important is that it's coupled to the material re parameterization. Like, what is the response of this? So in order to calculate this, um, we, you run a design of experiments where in one direction you're varying cell size, in another direction you're vary, varying the um, thickness of your cells. So um, by coupling these together, basically what you can do is then run this, the field optimization um, to then compute like how something should be, how, how this Voronoi cell should be sized and, and thickened in real space in a real context of a real part. So I think the, the Again, the most important part here is not just we're looking, we're not just looking at a swatch uh, of, of like how the Voronoi unit cell is behaving. We're looking at like how a range of swatches is performing and mapping that back so that the system can optimize it and produce a, a varying design across space. In this case, producing a part that is, is um, I think, 
15% mass reduction, but also designed for osseo integration. So we're targeting a specific cell size or a porosity at the surface so that it better integrates with bone. So field optimization unlocks a, a huge class of new design pr optimization problems, and that can be solved in, in NTOP and are being solved in NTOP. Um, I talked a little bit about lattices, so periodic lattices are re repeating structures in space. Um, stochastic lattices, so uh, Voronoi foams, things like that. Um, Multi-phase lattices, so this would be lattices where we have multiple different unit cells, so different types of unit cells in space. Um, User-defined manufacturing constraints, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end, but I think this is like, the most interesting part of this. Um, shell and infill structures, and composite materials that you can plug right into. Um, yeah, the, the last example I'll talk about is the NASA Excite Bracket. Um, so the design goal here is to, to lightweight this part, and it's subject to stability and stiffness constraints. So the goal here is yeah, to minimize the weight. Um, and we're going to compare two different strategies here uh, just to show like, what field optimization kind of results look like um, and how they compare to something like topology optimization, um, which is another, another reasonable approach for this type of problem. So with the shell infill parameterization, basically we start with the geometry parameterization again, um, which is a lot like the top up. You're going to get a, a, a result that is of like following a similar pattern as topology optimization, um, then followed by kind of like a, a shell thickness, um, and then the uh, infill thickness. So basically, the geometry for that defines like how something should be infilled in space, um, and what that's being coupled with is a material parameterization. So basically, from these three things, where should it be void? Where should it be solid or shelled? And where should it be filled? And filled meaning, meaning like the gyroid, for example. Um, and we'll see the results here, just in comparison to the topology optimization. Um, the results look roughly the same on the surface. Um, the field optimization is a bit like thicker looking. The topology optimization produces kind of thin struts. So in this case, we. We, we think that field optimization actually is a great approach because it's not producing thin elements that are going to be prone to buckling. Um, and instead, you're using the kind of like the, the infill and the shelling to um, produce a better performing part when it comes to metal frequency. So yeah, if we, if we look at the results, the, the results are clear. Um, uh, comparing topology optimization and field optimization, um, we've increased the, the minimum modal frequency, 81%. Um, Increased the loading or the buckling load factor by almost 90. We've achieved the max displacement. Um, both of them are achieving it, and reduced the weight. So there are definitely trade-offs, but in this case, this is a, like a superior approach. Um, and again, I'll, I'll end on this future workflows. I think the most important part about this, again, like I've said, is the openness. Um, and I think we believe in a future where generative design is not just bound to 3D printing and lattices and all of that. So I think what's the real power of this optimization engine is that you can start to map the, the kind of logic about material and geometric parameters back to um, traditional manufacturing methods. So in this case, we're applying what looks like a topology optimization, similar to a topology optimization, but it has additional constraints so that, that make it easier to manufacture. So in this case, you could manufacture from um, a single direction. Uh, it's designed for, this pocketing is designed in a way that is, it, it's, um, it maps well to traditional manufacturing as well as uh, additive manufacturing. Um, yep, yeah. and that's all that I have. Thank you, everyone.